What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind, behind being a college basketball coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant coach with a tremendous work ethic, a great talent evaluator and recruiter, great teacher, ability to relate to student athletes, and someone that I see as a future head coach in this business, and he's a native of Raleigh, North Carolina, Justin Bradley. Now, Justin, a little bit about him before I bring him on. He's a uh, 2013 graduate of Guilford College, where he played and was a student assistant coach. Um, you know, and that, that's a lot of times when I always ask that question, uh, individuals usually get hurt, where they can still continue to be a part of the program. And that's what Justin did and from 2013 to 2015, after he graduated, had a chance to go over and be a director of basketball operations at North Carolina Central for year one. And he was a graduate assistant uh, the second year, working on, started working on his master's. Um, and so, uh, you know, Justin, actually, they did a lot of winning at North Carolina Central. I was talking off air before I came on. They actually beat us my first year at Old Dominion. I can still remember that. Um, and then he went up to, and, I, and this is an interesting one, up to Hanover, uh, New Hampshire. I'm still trying to figure out why, but, uh, <laughs> you know, being a guy from the South, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm glad it worked out for him, though. Uh, he spent a year up at Dartmouth College as an assistant coach. And then he goes over to Williams College, one of the best Division three programs in the country, uh, where for two years he actually ended up being uh, finishing top five. Uh, one of the years, 2016-17, I believe they were in the Final Four. Uh, so he a tremendous job while he was there. And in 2018, uh, he goes back to Dartmouth. And for the first couple of years, he's an assistant coach. And then, you know, last summer, uh, you know, a lot of things start happening for him. He's named, uh, you know, one of the top 30 coaches on the 30. He's also, uh, you know, became the associate head coach at Dartmouth College. I mean, I want to welcome to the show. You know, it's funny, I, talking off air a little bit, I can remember him as a, as a, as a player. You know, I'm, getting, I'm really getting old. Um, so I want to welcome to the show Justin Bradley. How you doing, Justin? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I've been watching these and following you and, you know, I'm really honored to be on here. There's been a lot of great coaches that you've interviewed, so thank you. Man, you're welcome, man. So look, we're going to get right into it. We're going to get unmasked. One of the first things I like to ask guys and kind of bring them back, and I, and I say you're young and bright, and I'm serious about that. Like, he he hasn't been in it, but obviously he's, you know, he's going to be projected. Like, I mean, when you, you start looking at you in the Ivy League early, I mean, you went me act to Ivy League to one of the top Division three, so he's on that academic realm. Uh, but there's no handbook, man, in being a college basketball coach. It's just not. Um, you know, someone said it last night. I was on the Zoom. Like, I've almost become what the 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 uh, the book, the handbook to being a college coach now. But tell me about your first day, first week, first month after things are done with human resources or orientation. Especially like no one gives you direction. You think you know all the answers. And that can be from when you started at North Carolina Central as a Dobo, or you can even talk about when you started at Dartmouth, because now you're thrown in the road. It's recruiting and all of that stuff. So talk about that. No, that's a really good question and it takes me down memory lane. Uh, the first you know, my first experience working at North Carolina Central, I've known Coach Moten, Lavelle Moten, for a really long time. He was my middle school coach. So I've known him uh, since eighth grade. And from that time, eighth grade to when I graduated college, he became a, a Division One head coach and a successful one at that. So um, my first day on the job was not a lot of instruction, not a lot. There was no booklet. There wasn't a to-do list. There wasn't anything like that. It was, a, hey, this is what we do here. This is how we do it. Um, you know, something he always says is the standard is the standard. And the, pr the year prior, they, ha they had been 22 and nine and, you know, creeping up the MEAC ranking. So the expectations were high because we had a lot of seniors and a lot of really talented players. So, um, 
also on that staff, we worked with Brian Berg, um, who's now the head coach at Georgia Southern. Um, so he was someone that, you know, took me under his wing and taught me everything. And then uh, Lamar, we worked with uh, Mike Cotton as well. So he, you know, has some really experienced coaches, um, coaching staff. Lavelle is great at what he does. Um, but I was thrown into the fire, that's for sure. And, and, and you know, a couple months after college to, to be thrown in a director of operations role is, it was intimidating, but those guys helped me out and, and, and we won a lot of games. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned some good names, man. Like, you know, Coach Berg, like, uh, his f- finished up his first year. Coach Mike Cotton, veteran in the game, you know, played at a high level. And we coached, he was at, uh, he was at Bucknell when I was at American. So I've kind of, you know, known Mike uh, a long time. You have some good guys that help you, like you said, veteran guys who probably didn't treat you like just a young kid. It's like, this is what you need to know. So, I mean, that, that's, that's great on their part. And, and you willing to learn was a plus as well. Well, I'm going to ask you about this because recruiting. Recruiting is the lifeline of college athletics. Like, and in your case, you didn't know, probably didn't do, you know, you probably did some things in recruiting at North Carolina Central, but now you're going to Dartmouth. And I always say this in recruiting, and especially in your case, you have to get good players if you want to be successful. You have to get, in your case, great students. And and then third, you got to get, you know, good, great people. And if you get those three, that combination of those three, you're probably going to win a lot of basketball games. Talk about your best and worst recruiting experiences you may have had just in your short time of, you know, having a chance to coach at, at Dartmouth, then to Williams, and, and, and back at Dartmouth. Absolutely. No, that's a, another good question. My – uh in terms of how I got organized with recruiting, a lot of that came from Brian Berg and just seeing how he did things. So although I was the director of ops, you know, he was relentless on the phone. He was relentless, you know, talking to people around each kid. He knew everyone. He, you know, he always said the best recruiters are the ones with the most information. And that's something that I always take with me uh, since that time is to, to get all the information. So no surprises, as you know, you don't want to get to the 11th hour or at the finish line and, and the kids like, Hey, I'm coach, I'm not coming. And that things can't come out of left field. And as we know, our bosses don't like surprises as head coaches either. So <laughs> um, that's really where it started. So, you know, I was able to, you know, watch him and talk to him and ask a lot of questions and, and those guys that I worked with, you know, really laid the foundation. So once I got the job at Dartmouth, I was ready to go. So although I hadn't been, you know, sitting in the AAU gyms for 12 hours or what, however long, I was ready to go and I knew how to be organized and I had a process. Um, and then my first recruiting story is I get sent to Montreal uh, <laughs> from Dartmouth. So within 24 hours of taking the job, and Montreal is about two and a half hours north of Dartmouth. So not, not a big trip. And, you know, anytime you could drive is nice. Um, but I don't have, at this time, you know, you don't have GPS. I didn't know I need to switch my phone to the international plan. So I, I remember printing out MapQuest directions going into Montreal, just a day trip, go, go there and come back. And, and there was a lot of construction going on in Montreal on my way. So <laughs> I didn't know where I was. I couldn't call anybody. Um, and I ultimately find the place. But that was my first experience. But it was exciting because I'm, you know, I'm 24 at the time and in another country recruiting Canadian players and, you know, a Division One assistant coach. That's awesome, man. Like, I, I, those are the stories you like. Like, it was, you know, like you said, you, things that you didn't know or, like, you assumed, like, you know, like not knowing, no, not switching over your phone or like, you know, not like you in another country, you don't know, like, you know, the it's roads, they're doing on. work, you know, like you don't know any of that stuff. So, right. you know, hey, but you learn and then next time you go, you like, all right, this is what I have to do. So <laughs> that, 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 was a, that was a learning experience as well. That's a good thing. Like you're young. So you graduate from college and you go right into it. People don't understand how much time and effort that you put into college athletics. Like it's, you know, 355, 360 days of the year, you're involved in coaching. Whether you grad assistant, dobo, 
direct the basketball out. It, it don't matter. Like you don't really have a light. And now you just finished playing. You got to have a passion for it. But like, talk about what you had to sacrifice um, to achieve your current level of success. Cause you got young, you're young. You know, you probably, you got friends who are getting married. You got kids want to think people want to go like take vacations. They want to go down to the beaches. Like, what did you have to sacrifice to achieve your current level of success? No, absolutely. We, um, you know, a lot, I don't think a lot of people outside of the industry understand that the amount of time you spend as a coach and, and what, 20, 30 percent of it is basketball. It is so, yes, I am a coach and I love basketball and I love the game and I try to be as knowledgeable as possible. But, you know, when you have 15, 16 guys on your team, that's 16 personalities. That's 16 guys that that need things or need some type of assistance that could be academically, that could be socially, you know, something may be going wrong at home with their family. So you have to make sure all of your guys are doing okay. And that takes a lot of your time. And then also your staff, you know, you want to be a servant to your head coach and whatever he needs and whatever time he needs it is your job to get it done. And that's something that, you know, we try to be really good at as a coach and, you know, you're always on call. So even if you go home, all right, I'm done for the day, get something to eat, you know, maybe <laughs> watch a movie. And then 20 minutes later, you get a call from one of your guys or your boss or assistant coach or a parent or somebody in administration and you got to put out the fire. So, you know, it's definitely a, a 24 seven gig, but, you know, I don't, I don't see myself as a cubicle type guy and, you know, I, I, I thrive off of problem solving and, and working with other people. And, and that's something that, you know, excites me about the job that every day I wake up, check my phone. All right. No, no, no red flags, no fires, and then attack the day as it comes. <laughs> wow. Wow, man. You know what? I, I'm listening to you and like, yeah, you, like I said, you're young, and you, but like you, you have a lot of knowledge. You work like I'm those guys did a tremendous job with you, the guys you work with, work with before, like, because you do sound so knowledgeable, like, you sound better than some guys who've been in the business for 15, 20 years. I, I mean, so, I mean, it's amazing just to listen to to you. You're, you're a lot more polished than I even thought, um, you know, coming in. I mean, I'm, I'm excited listening to this. Um, scouting, I mean, we know that's a huge part in this profession. Um, you know, you got to get scout reports right. Yo, know, your each coach that you work with, I, I don't like using the word for. Uh, I think you work with people, everybody's for the common goal. Uh, yeah, there's a title, head coach, assistant coach, whatever. But like, you can always tell who scout it is, like who's the most animated on the sideline. You know, like you're yelling at, you're yelling at kids, and you spent seven, you watched seven or eight game film, whereas. You know, you're only showing them an edit tape. And so, like, you expect them to know just as much as you, but you got to be smart at the same time and understand all the time that you put in, they got other stuff going on as well. They got to study. You know, they, they got life issues is going on. And so you got to give them just enough information for them to be successful. Because if you try to give them too much, it's going to be overload and they're gonna they're not going to get it. So... Talk about, you know, your best and worst scout reports. And we all know this too, Justin, like you tell, you, you got your verbiage better be correct because you can tell them like, you know, they're struggling from three. They made two out of the last 30 and all they heard was two to 30. And if you don't say they're a capable shooter, soon as they make a couple, they looking at you on the bench. The head coach is looking at you saying, you told me he couldn't shoot. Coach, I never <laughs> said that. I said, he's struggling. He's a capable shooter. So talk about your best and worst scout reports over the years. Yeah, absolutely. So I think wherever you go, scouting looks a little bit different. So when I was at Williams College, um, you know, there's only two assistant coaches. So you're doing every other scout. So we, we play 30 games in a season. That's 15 scouts. Now you say that to a, a division one coach and they're like, man, that's a lot. Or you even say that to an NBA guy and they, you know, NBA guys they have six teams or five teams and, you know, they make it work. So, you know, I really got a lot of practice there, just being able to watch film, break it down quickly, start noticing 
different things about the game, but also similarities in what people do and in, um, in their schemes and, and strategies. So I think that's where I really grew on scouting. And then also, you know, and now at Dartmouth, we split it three ways with our three assistants. And so I'm able to, you know, really focus in on the six or seven teams that I may have. As you said, we're watching seven or eight games, um, you know, and I think everybody takes, takes, you know, a lot of pride in those scouts because you spend a lot of time with it. Like, <laughs> you know, some guys, you know, their heads on the pillow and you're watching another game and, you know, where does it end? You're like, maybe I should watch a little bit more. Maybe I should watch their baseline out of bounds. Wait, what's their, you know, if we press them, what are they going to do? Like, there's just so many nuances of the game that you want to make sure you have because your job is to be the expert if it's your scout. And, you know, luck, thankfully, my boss gives us, you know, a lot of free freedom and, and reign with that. So, hey, what should we do offensively? What should we do defensively? What do they do here? What do they do there? So we're spending a lot of time in our league scouting. Um, it's heavy scouting in the Ivy League. And as you said, we have to be sharp with our delivery because these guys are smart guys and, and they're going to ask questions and you have to, you know, <laughs> you have to know the answer or figure out an answer and you know the why is really important for our guys and and you know that's something that's made me a better coach is because I don't go in there with very many holes because I, I can't. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I, being in the Ivy League so you know I was brought up in the era that whatever coach said you did right <laughs> and you probably kept coach Billman probably was that way you probably had the old school guy right. but things change because Kids, I just thought everything started evolving. And so it took me, I got to the Ivy League in 2008, and I saw it even more when I was at American. Like, kids want to know why are, we, why are we doing this? And I'm like, so I realized I believe Patriot League kids, they're <laughs> analytical. Like, they analyze every situation. So you can't be like, we're doing this, and they're going to be like, why? You got to have an answer. You, you, you hit it right on the head. They want to know why are we why are we guarding the ball screen this way? Why can't we guard it this way? And so you you always have to have a why with them. And I mean, I caught myself a couple of times saying like, because I said so, but you can't <laughs> say that. <laughs> they don't get that part. And you and you're young enough where you you probably play for an older school, old school coach, but you also can relate to them a little bit from an age standpoint. So that why, man, is 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 huge. Uh, and I'll you know, I think coaches are getting trying to get better at it. The older school guys don't want to hear it, but the younger school coaches, yeah. uh, you know, they're starting to like, you know, they got they got to adapt. I mean, that's just what it is. Um, what's the biggest challenge, man? You think you've experienced since you've been in college coaching? Yeah, I think just just balance, just finding that balance of, you know, doing everything I can to help the program and you know help our guys be as successful as they can be um, individually so again as we talked about that can be that can take a lot of time so where does that time leave for me as a person and you know for family for you know social activities or you know and vacation like i haven't thought about a vacation and <laughs> like you know i I've, i haven't looked at any flights or any tropical places and since i've started coaching and you know, outside of planning an MTE, and, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think not having a season this year, I've been a lot better about just because we've had more time to, to do things. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there's always going to be challenges, especially as a black coach and, and, you know, trying to make my way. And as you know, you, you read my bio, I don't have the, the coaching tree. I don't have the pedigree. My, my, my uncle isn't George Ravelin. Like I, I, I'm trying to get this, you know, the only way I know how, and, you know, up until this point, you know, I've gotten to a really good place and, you know, it's a lot of people I work with just allowing me to show me what you can do and I show them and then they give me more responsibility. And that, that's, that's awesome. I mean, like, I mean, you're right. Like, it, it is a lot, it's a lot of guys, 90 plus percent of the business is like you, you know, like you don't have a pedigree. You don't have like, so you got to figure out how to make your way. And I, I think you, like I said, you've done a, a great job so far. And I think it's going to get better. Um, 
you know, I I, I just I mean I'm listening to you and I'm 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 stunned. I'm 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 blown away more than anything, like just how much you can command uh attention and, and, and things of that nature. So I mean and that's just like 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 I said, I don't I didn't know you, but like now listening to you, I'm it's very impressive uh to hear the things you have to say. Um do you ever find um things that, that there are things about you that people might misunderstand, like you know, like they see you, but they don't really know you. And so people might say, you know what, he don't really talk to anybody. He's standoffish, <laughs> like different things like that. Is there anything that, you know, people see you and be like, uh, and they, they, they misunderstand you? Yeah, I think, you know, since I've spent the last five years in academic schools, Williams College and Dartmouth, you know, those are the as elite as they come. Um, and I think people just automatically, you know, identify me as an academic guy or that's who I am. And, you know, if you look at my background, like my experience at North Carolina Central was was unbelievable. And not only the winning, yes, that was great. With 53 and 14, go to NCAA tournament the first year. That year we beat you guys, we were 28 and six. Um, you know, we had a really good year, 15, you know, 15 and one in the MEAC. And then that second year I was there we lose in the conference tournament, but we were 25 and eight and 16 and 0 in the MEAC. So, you know, we win a lot of games and it was really fun. I learned a lot, um, obviously, you know, and, you know, I think people are starting to take notice that Lavelle Moton is an unbelievable basketball coach um, in mind. He, he is, you know, I've worked for some really good coaches and have observed the game, but, you know, the things that he's able to do with the resources that he has and, you know, he really knows the game. And, and from a player development perspective, from offensive, defensive perspective, like, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. So I, um, you know, I try to take, pick up things everywhere I go and from everyone I'm around. I'm always, you know, I'm always trying to learn, even from the guys that I work with now. Like, yeah, I'm the associate head coach, but I'm learning from the third assistant every single day. I learned from our director of ops. You know, he was at Boston College and Pitt and, you know, I've never been at those levels, so I can pick up some things from him. And, you know, our other assistant, you know, he worked at Colby College, Boston, and and a few other places. So I'm always listening and asking, and hey, what about this? What about this? And, and you know, doing whatever I can to make the, the program better. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Like, um, I'm going to ask you this. Like, we're in the in, – and like you said, uh, you said this, like, from – you said, uh, you know, yeah, you get, you get, it's like a stigma. Like you get, oh, he's an academic guy. And I, and I, it should be like, man, when I got to the Ivy League at Brown, I was like, yo, I went to, I'm from an HBCU. I was in the CIAA. I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the Ivy League. I'm not, and I wasn't a smart guy, but I'm like, it's just interesting. Like you get labeled as that person and like, just because you've been in that realm, but. I mean, you know, like you said, like, I, I just think um, if things will work out best for you, I mean, you're with a good personnel. David's a great person. But, like, I just think, like, yeah, that, that stigma got to kind of go away from not just you, but other guys like that as well. I always... we're, listen, we're all in the educating business. And when I say that is, like, you just talked about learning. We're also teaching. Um, and you're not always just teaching basketball. But, like, what do you try to teach your players besides basketball? It could be things, like, off the court. Like, what are you trying to teach them or what are you trying to educate them on? There's, you know, there's so many things you can teach your guys because, <clears throat> excuse me, you spend so much time with them. You know, you spend more time than their, you know, their parents. You spend more time with them than their siblings. So they might have an older brother or an uncle that they live with or, you know, was their guardian, but, you know, their coaches are spending most of the time. So you, you really have an ability to really impact all of the players that you bring in. And, and so that can be, hey, this is how you study in, in, in an Ivy League school, or this is how you study once you get to college, because there's always a transition. You, you know, there's so many life things that, you know, I, I can talk to our guys about. Our team has gotten a lot more diverse over the years. And, you know, we live in Hanover, New Hampshire. Like, uh, you can ask a lot of, you know, minorities, where's New Hampshire? They're like, oh, 
I have no idea. And, you know, so just helping people navigate this type of environment, the weather is cold, yes it is, but this is an opportunity, you know, that's gonna help you for the next 40 years. And, and so there's so many things we can teach them. Hey, how do I talk to my professor? How do I ask for help? How do I, hey, I like this girl in my math class, like, what should I do? Like, or, you know, there's so many things, social media awareness, like, hey guys, like, you probably shouldn't put this on there or here's why. Um, so just educating them from our experiences, but also, you know, showing them like, hey, here's an article from a player at X school and, and he got in trouble because he posted this, like, we don't want to be the, those guys. And um, so there's a lot of things. And, you know, I, I don't think I quite realize what I'm teaching them, but um, it's an everyday conversation about something non-basketball. So true, so true, my man. Um, I asked this question, you can't, you can't include Coach Moten, um, and, and, you, and I, I'm a, I pick it back on what you said earlier, like, people be like, oh, he's the best coach in the MEAC, and I'm like, no, he's one of the best coaches in the country, and you're 100% right, I don't think people realize how good he is, like, people see him in the, you know, what they see on social media, like, he's the top. Like, I don't think people understand how good he is as a basketball coach, like how like, how he manages the game and things of that nature. I mean, you're 100% right on that. But I ask this is, you can't use him, but if you had a chance to work for, work with some guys in college basketball that you like, wow, I would like, or sit down with, not even just work with, but let me sit down with these guys, pick their brains, see what makes them tick, like, who are some guys that you would say? And and you can do past or present. And the reason why I say past is because the recent deaths of John Thompson and John Chaney, you may not be old enough to remember them from when they were coaching, but I'm sure you you sound like a, a basketball, uh, you know, student of the game, so you, you know it a little bit. But is there anyone you would like, hey, man, I want to sit down with three or four guys and be like, pick their brain? Yeah, no, it's funny that you say that because I'm in the middle of reading uh, Coach Thompson's book. Um, so I came as a shadow and, you know, being my age, you know, I know who he was. I know how much of an impact he is, but I know it from a distance. I don't remember, you know, I'm not from the DMV. I didn't play at Georgetown. I didn't coach against him. I, so it's all just like folklore to me. And, you know, I know the towel. I know he's a big guy and I know he spoke his mind outside and won a lot of games outside of that you know I didn't know the the detail behind how why um and the book has been really good for me to again answer those questions like why did he do this why did he think this way why did he how did he get Georgetown to be you know every, the people joke around I thought it was an HBCU when people were growing up like why did people think that so I don't remember all of that but just to go down his whole timeline it's been amazing for me and, and uh, I've talked to a lot of coaches about it and anyone that I could talk to I'm like hey read this book read this book and it's, it's been very inspirational for me um, and I'm sure we could talk more about that after this but um, that is definitely one person um, that I would love to talk to I'm gonna say this uh, I read the book in two days I couldn't put it down <laughs> yeah. um, I think I got it Christmas Whatever it was, Christmas Eve, Christmas, I mean, I was, two days I was done. And, and I didn't like, it wasn't one of those I'm listening either. It was, I read the book. Um, <laughs> and, right. and like, I don't know why, I mean, I don't know why I read it. Um, Cause I know I, I ordered it and it was on my phone. I actually read it on my phone. Um, I mean, that, that's how amazing it was. I just couldn't put it down because I grew up a Georgetown fan. Um, I grew up, you know, just, you know, seeing what he did and, the things he did, you know, in the in the DC community and what he did for everyone else. So, I mean, I'm saying when I said that was one of the fastest books I've ever read, <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable um, to, to me. Um, but I'm gonna ask you this because you, even though you're young, you can you can have these things and it has nothing to do with wins and losses. Sometimes it could be other things, but like, what's one of what's the biggest accomplishment? you think you've experienced since you've been a college coach? Yeah. Um, 
there's been so many and in this business if you want to do it a long time and as you know you've done it a long time just you have these small victories right that you like whether it's getting getting a commitment whether it's winning a game whether it's we went over this baseline out of bounds and they did and we stole the ball like there's always these little victories that you live for every single day in this job because you have to have those because there's a lot of letdowns there's a lot of no's from commit from recruits there's a lot of no's from your boss there's a lot of uh, no's from your players and you got to handle that a certain way and um, so I think there's always a lot of small victories that I look for and try to really value that you know make up a really good you know positive experience for me um, and I hope that's not coach speak to you uh, you know I think it's every single day I'm looking all right today our, all our guys went to class. That's a victory right there. <laughs> Today, we got a call from our top recruit. He says we're in his final, final five. That's a victory. Like whether we get him or not, that's a bigger victory. But, you know, there's different levels to, to success in this business. And as long as you just keep chipping away um, little by little at each of those, and, you know, the big success will come at some point. Wow. Well, I mean, uh, I like that. Like, they are big. I mean, they have victories, little victories. I like that. I definitely like that. I might have to steal that, man. <laughs> I'm gonna ask this. This is more of an entertaining. I don't even know if people do this anymore. Life has changed so much. Like when I say that, because what movie or TV show title best describes your week? So, like you, you had a, you haven't had a chance to coach this year. And I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back with a question on that because. Yours has been a little different. I'm good friends with Trey Montgomery at Penn, so I've talked to him about this. I just want to get your opinion on it as well. But like, but what movie or TV show title best describes your week? <laughs> this current week or or my typical week? <laughs> in any particular week, what, what would you say? Man, <laughs> well, one of my favorite movies of all times is Money Talks, so I'm gonna go with that. <laughs> You sure you're not older, man? Like, you sure? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just turned 30, so. <laughs> <laughs> Money talks. I like that. I like that. Um, what's your favorite word or phrase you like to use? Uh, I would say it's, it's, it's all about the end result. And that's, you know, that's something that I use probably every day. Um, I, I really believe that there's so many ways to do this, right? As a coach, as a program, every, you know, Villanova does it different than Michigan. Michigan does it different than Gonzaga, but they're all still, you know, very successful programs and coaches. And, you know, the process doesn't really matter because if there's 20 different processes that work, then it's not about the process. It's about the end result. And what's the end result? You want to win some games. You want to have some fun. You want to win some championships. You want to graduate guys. You want to, you know, give your guys a good four-year experience. So, um, yeah, I try to focus on the end result and not to get mixed in the, in the, in the weeds. Like if my boss asks me something, I'm not like, hey, well, I emailed this person. I talked to the mom, but I don't know. Like I'm like, coach, it's done. What else you got for me? And you know, I think he appreciates that. <laughs> Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask you this. Like, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Just, uh, I think this came from Brian Berg, just to be innovative and um, never stop learning. I think, you know, people get to certain places and, you know, a lot of people in this business, they get, you know, stagnant because they, you know, they do a really good job where they are, you know, they're content with where they are and they just ride it out, but they, they stop asking the questions. They stop, you know, talking to people, they stop reading, they stop, you know, watching as much film as they did when they were younger. Um, so just keeping, you know, the, the end goal in mind, but also each day making sure I'm doing things that, you know, will help me reach the end goal. And if, you know, when I go to bed at night, I'm like, Okay, did I give it my all? And I, my answer is no. Then I stay up a little bit longer. If the answer is yes, you know, then I'll be ready for the next day. So just wow. be innovative. Uh, yep, being innovative. 
you know, bringing new ideas to wherever you are. And that can change, right? I'm here, so it's easy to do that. Hey, Dartmouth's never done this. We've never done that. Let's try this. But in a place like North Carolina Central or, you know, if I'm working at an ACC school, like bringing a new innovative idea to how to do things, that's hard to do. Uh, but that's something I'm always thinking about. Wow. Deep. I like it. You know, and like, I'm just listening to you and I've heard you on a couple of Zooms, especially, uh, you know, what I, I call it, the uh, AG, the, the AG Sunday Night Groove. <laughs> I added the name to that. Uh, so if you're a Carolina person, North Carolina, South Carolina, could be Virginia, everybody's been on a part of the AG, the AG Sunday Night Groove. But uh, like I said, you're not a self-promoter. You never have. You probably sit back and listen more than anything. Um, if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, which would you choose? I would just say extremely uh, versatile. Um, I would say dedicated um, and um, <laughs> good question. Um, and the third one would be, you know, I would say positive. Um, I try to be very direct, but positive in my delivery. Mm, three good ones, three yeah. good ones. I'm going to ask you this, because it's, and, and, um, it's, it sounds like it's going to probably be kind of similar to you anyway, but like, what qualities do you value in the people with whom you spend time? Yeah, I think... Um, Communication is is always important to me. Um, just, just I, I would prefer people to be direct in their communication. I think not only because that's how I am, but I also think you know it, it takes away the fluff. Um, so people that are really good communicators, um, what good or bad, that doesn't mean communicate the good things. Hey, this is what's going on. I think that's really important. Um, uh, people that you know care about things other than themselves. Um, yes, we all have egos. Yes, we're all competitive as coaches. A lot of us are former players, um, but you still have to care about other people outside of yourself. <laughs> and that's what you're gonna do in this business. You know, a lot of the time, you're not worrying about yourself, you're worrying about someone else. Um, so I think those two things are really important, just being a really good communicator and, and just caring about things outside of yourself. So not selfish. <laughs> I like that. And that's why that's one of the big reasons I like doing this show is I like getting selfless people on this show. It, it shows you can't, that's one thing you can't fake. You can't, you know, like you can be, it's going to come out. If you're a selfless person, it definitely is going to come out. Um, and, and I'm going to say what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Yeah, it's always going to be, um, you know, it's pretty easy for me, uh, easy to refer back to a coach, uh, but it's my mom. She's, she's, uh, you know, I always, we're so similar in a lot of ways, and maybe that's why we always got in arguments, <laughs> but because we're very similar, and she's always on me, and, but she's also always supported me since day one, and, you know, when I tell her, I'm, hey, I know I just graduated college, but I'm going to take this job and work. 80 hours and make no money she didn't say wait are you crazy she said if that's what you want to do like you know just give it your all and see where it takes you so you know she's very inspirational to me she calls me every day no matter how old I get I'll be however age she calls me and you know I'm thankful that I'm able to have that relationship and you know get her up here as much as she wants to come so which isn't often but <laughs> i get her up here and she talks about how cold it is for 48 hours so <laughs> trust me i know about the northeast i live in <laughs> rhode island so i hey getting parents up to, to the northeast yeah i mean that, that's a tough one. um you know a lot, visit, a lot of visitors in the 757 right right <laughs> Right. You don't want to come it's by. Always, it was funny. I worked with Phil Martelli Jr. for two years at Central Connecticut. And I remember he used to talk about the cold weather. And <laughs> Howie Dickman said, 
what Philadelphia is tropical or something? Like <laughs> it's still cold and it's snowed out, you know. So that was like a hilarious statement. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you. I mean, it's different because of your situation or y'all situation in the Ivy League, and I just want to know how how did. We know how the effect is on the players. I mean, that's not, that's tough. But like, talk about you, like you, you know, you've been coaching, you know, like, you know, you were one of the first to stop last year, but like you come into the year and to find out you're not going to coach this year. Like, how has it affected you from a, you know, mentally? Like how, because you got to, you got to be as positive, strong for these kids. How has it kind of affected you a little bit? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it wasn't, you know, when the decision happened, I wouldn't say it was very surprising. Um, I think it was kind of expected, at least from the coaches. And, and yeah, we were very positive with our guys and, you know, we haven't heard anything. So just, you know, we prepared like as if we were going to have a season up until that point. Um, but when the decision was made, you know, again, the, the most important thing is the players. Like, how are they feeling? What are they thinking? You know, picking their brains, just, just listening to them, just letting them, whether it was vent, whether it was, you know, I don't like the Ivy league or whether I'm transferring, whatever it was, we had to listen and, and, you know, really take a pulse on the situation. Um, me, uh, respectively for me, um, uh, I started making a plan and reaching out to people of, you know, a lot of coaches, Hey, I would, I, I would copy and paste the same text of, Hey, what are some things that I could do during this time so that the season, you know, that I'm not, I'm still developing as a coach. I'm still learning. Um, what are you, what are recommendations do you have? So a lot of coaches were, you know, helpful and helping and saying like, Hey, watch the NBA, watch, you know, watch European game, make sure, you know, you're hopping on zooms with AAU coaches and, you know, make sure you're, you know, keep, make sure your guys are okay, but there's so many things that um, I could do professionally over this year that will help me out long-term. So, you know, my goal was to, goal was set in November is, you know, what do we always ask our players over the summer is, hey, come back a better player, do this. If you, if you go away for two weeks, make sure you're in shape when you get back. So I take that same mentality of, you know, I, I gotta come back a better coach, whether there's a season or not um, next year, I need to be a better at scouting. I need to be better at recruiting. I need to be better in player development. I need to be, you know, have 20 ideas of how we can make our, you know, facilities better and earn, you know, get some money for the program. So, you know, that's something I was able to do um, November, December, and then we've been doing workouts, which has been nice. Like we, we've been able to do some skill development and some small group stuff and, you know, it's really hard to, to ask your guys to, to run some sprints when you don't have a game in the next couple of days. But <laughs> um, we've made it work. And, you know, honestly, a testament to the players. They they've you know, they've been very positive and just kind of, all right, this is what it is. A minor setback and we'll be ready to go when the time comes. Great stuff, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, your answer. Like, knowing what you know now, because like, um, what would you tell your younger self? Because you know, you're still young. But like, <laughs> what would you tell your younger self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Like, you know, the route you've taken and all that. But like, what would you tell your younger self? Yeah, I would say, you know, I think about this all the time. I would say don't, um, you know, work really hard, but just do not have your head on a swivel. And I say that, Meaning, I think a lot of times in this business, as you know, um, being in the game and knowing everyone you know, just you're always looking what's there, what's out there, what can I do? What, like always looking and, and not that you're not doing your job because you're going to do your job because you have to and you have to do it well. But you're, you're just always listening and looking and checking websites and checking records and and doing all those things and, you know. Uh, checking hoop dirt and like seeing what's going on. And, you know, I think, you know, you learn that early on that like, you know, information is out there, but um, you know, I just think not worrying about that stuff as much and, and really connecting with people and being good at your craft, because at some point somebody's going to ask you to do something and 
you're either going to know how to do it and you're not and that's going to determine your trajectory right hey like Justin, I need you to, you know, work on that, make our offense a little bit better. What ideas do you have? Oh, well, I didn't really do the offense coach. Oh, okay. Well, Hey, can you help our defense? Like we, we need to be better. What, what ideas do you have from watching our games? Well, coach, like I only did the offense. So, you know, things like that, you know, you have to just, you know, be involved in all aspects of coaching and, and, and force yourself to be. So even if your boss assigns you, a certain task, hey, you're the defensive coordinator this year, you better be sitting in those offensive meetings as well. And you better be best friends with the offensive coordinator as well. So, you know, that's what I would tell myself just to whatever your tasks are, make sure you master those and do the best job that you can, but also be gaining the knowledge from the people around you. Awesome, man. That's, that, that's, that's, that's great information right there. Well, look, I want to thank you again, um, Justin, for being a uh, guest on the show and, and being unmasked. Is there anything you want to say to the viewers before we go? Yeah, I'm happy to, you know, if anyone, hopefully people listen to this and listen to me. I know they've listened to the other coaches. Uh, so that's number one. Just anybody want to reach out and talk basketball or, or you know, talk recruiting or anything or you know, the business, you know, I'm happy to do that. And you know, I always get back to everybody and it might not be timely, but I'm going to get back to you at some point. Um, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. Now you're welcome, man. And this bit, like to me, I, like I said, I, I learn every time I come on this and I took a lot of stuff from you today. I, I, I didn't, I didn't look at you as, I look at you as a young and young coach in age, but like you sound like a veteran coach <laughs> in this business. And I believe your future is really bright. Thank Not just, I mean, you're associate head coach under 30. That doesn't happen to a lot of people. And it is a reason why, you know, Coach Lafayette, he, he trusts you. Like, um, and so, like, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't be shocked, you know, like you're somewhere else. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying Dave, he's leaving. I'm not saying that. But I think guys like yourself, you're, it's going to be hard for you not for people to be, well, it's going to be hard to people not ringing your phone calling you and knocking on the door saying, I want to speak to him. So, um, I'm, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to your future, um, not just on the dock, but down the road. And, and like I said, thanks again for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I want to say thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe. Thank you.